Hello everyone, I'm Justin Paperni with White Collar Advice and I'm pleased to welcome back to the program, show, whatever we call it, I'm pleased to welcome David Rosenfield back to the program. Hi David. Hi Justin, thanks for having me back. My pleasure, David. I want to do this video talking about pre-sentencing preparations, post-defense conduct, sentencing memorandums, in part because, well, I received an interesting phone call a couple of weeks ago. I was at ballet class with my daughter. We were leaving. I picked up the phone and a defendant said, Justin, my PSR interview is like 10 minutes. Why do you make such a big deal out of it? Do you do that to try to get business or to try to make it seem more important? And I said, no, it's very important that you prepare for it. It's a really big deal. And he said, but mine was like five or 10 minutes and my lawyer didn't prepare me at all. So I don't understand, you know, what really is there to do? And I was so bothered hearing that call, David, because I sense when his report comes back, it's not going to be as excellent as it should be. So I wanted to reach out to you and talk about the PSR. So let me jump right in. As a criminal defense attorney, former U.S. attorney, uh, offer some thoughts on the importance of the pre-sentence report and, and how you can help your clients prepare for that PSR. Okay, so first let's talk about the uh, pre-sentence investigation yes. and the interview with the probation officer. Yeah. That interview is absolutely critical and it's critical for a number of reasons. The uh, probation officer will act, not only will he prepare uh, a pre-sentence report, uh, he will make a recommend, he or she will make a recommendation, a sentencing recommendation to the judge. So mm -hmm. as a defendant, you want to be on the right side of the probation officer. And mm -hmm. the, your first contact with the probation officer is going to be at that initial interview. Mm -hmm. And the initial interview, Justin, is not five or ten minutes, it's an hour or two. Yep. Uh, they go through your background, your characteristics, your financial means, and so on. And the attorney should be preparing the defendant in depth for this interview, mm -hmm. uh, what to expect, uh, how to deal with the probation officer, going over the background, the characteristics, the history, and so on. It's a, an absolutely critical interview. I would never let a client of mine go to one of these interviews by themselves, and but nor would I ever allow them to go without being properly prepared. Right, and, and I think part of the reason that interview was so short was because, well, I've learned probation officers might ask more probing questions than others. So you can go down, go through background information for a moment. I've had, I've gotten calls from defendants who have had a PSR interview. They didn't get into their PS, they didn't get into any substance abuse. Just because they don't ask doesn't mean that you shouldn't articulate and express if substance abuse or drinking contributed to your conduct or medical issues that can influence the bunker your job in prison. So just because it doesn't come up doesn't mean you shouldn't be prepared to respond. And further, answering questions that fully display your remorse and contrition if you've pled guilty. And let's transition to that for a moment. I have gotten calls from defendants who have said, my PSR... I don't think I'm getting the credit that I should. You know, maybe I'm getting the three points off for acceptance of responsibility, but they're still recommending some upward variances. And when I read the report, I think part of it is because maybe the defendant pled guilty, but the report is written as if the defendant pled guilty because they knew they were caught or they pled guilty and said they're sorry because they want a shorter prison term. So talk about the importance of contrition and remorse and how that can influence this person that's going to make a recommendation on how long you should serve in prison. Real remorse. Well, it all starts with the, the whole idea of cooperation. If someone's mm -hmm. pled guilty, in many cases they've cooperated. And if they have cooperated, that's something that should be emphasized uh, at the uh, pre-sentence interview. Mm -hmm. um, if they pled guilty and they haven't cooperated, um, or if they were convicted after trial, that's the time to really emphasize remorsefulness, uh, the reasons why the conduct was committed. Um, and there's almost always uh, reasons why someone did what they did in terms of committing a crime, particularly if it's aberrational behavior and, and mm -hmm. this is the first time they've done anything. Um, and, and expressing uh, the fact that they, they won't be back again. Right. They're not going to do it again. Um, all of those are the kinds of things that the defendant has to get across to the probation officer at this pre-sentence interview uh, to make sure the, the probation officer understands that the defendant knows how serious it is and that they're not going to do this again. So let's talk about aberrational conduct. What helped me a great deal at my sentencing, I was initially looking at five years. That's what I thought I was going to get. 
The government eventually was said they were going to ask for 41 months and then 24 months in my sentencing, I got 18 months. But what helped in my PSR and in my sentencing paper from the government was they said my conduct was aberrational. Had I not been swept into this crime, doesn't excuse what I did. Had I not been swept into it, I probably wouldn't have done it. Defendants can get into trouble with post-offense conduct, which sort of smashes the aberrational right argument if you're continuing to do things. So let's talk about how post-offense conduct, misleading on financials, obviously committing new crimes, um, how doing some shady things can destroy that aberrational argument, or how it could just lead to a, a PSL report that's going to recommend you know, a, a, an upward variance that can make the prison term even longer. Let's talk about post-offense conduct. Yeah, post-offense conduct, the defendant has to be a model citizen, and of mm -hmm. course, not commit any further crimes. But one of the things that uh, defendants often fail to consider, and I know it's something that you focus mm -hmm. on, uh, Justin, is social media. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, 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 the probation officer, or even the prosecutors, will look on LinkedIn and, and Facebook and other social media to see if the defendant has said or done anything that's inconsistent with remorsefulness mm -hmm. to show that this is not aberrational behavior. So the defendant has to be on his or her best behavior, be very careful in terms of what they do, not only in the community, but um, on, on the, the, the social networks, uh, because that can cause all kinds of problems depending so, on what they say or comment on. So a couple of quick stories I heard over the last few years. A defendant reached out to me after the PSR came back that demonstrated his remorse but the PSR, the, the probation officer was knocking him because she didn't think he was transparent in his financials. And I said, well, what happened? The probation officer called his mom because he was living with his mom at the time before going to prison. And the mom said sort of half jokingly, wow, because of his conviction, it doesn't look like that $20,000 I lent him 10 years ago is ever going to come back to me. That's what a disappointment. And 10 years ago, she loaned him money. He didn't disclose it. So she immediately called him and said, why didn't you disclose in your PSR form this loan made to you from your mom? And he was, I forgot about it. I didn't think about it. That alone was a knock on him. Second, many years ago, a defendant who had some terrible press coverage through the Department of Justice press release paid a, like a reputation management company to create some of these puff piece like, um, you know, to try to bring down his Google releases. And it was just very, she didn't appreciate it. She thought that he was trying to diminish his role simply by creating these press releases that would push down. And those things alone prove your point about the social presence, LinkedIn, Facebook, or just trying to mask your conduct and what is out there. Um, I don't know, I'm sure we could talk about it all day. Let's transition to quickly the review of the PSR. So the PSR is going to come back two, three weeks later. Do you then sit down and spend time with your clients going through it line by line, making sure that it's accurate? And what if it is inaccurate? How do you fix it? Well, first what I do is I read it myself. Mm -hmm. I make notes. I, I, I make corrections and so on. Then I go over it with my client to make sure that he or she is in agreement. Mm -hmm. And after that, after we determine what, if anything's not accurate about the pre-sentence report, uh, we will prepare a letter to the probation officer saying, here's what we disagree with. You know, obviously don't indicate what you agree with. Uh, usually it's just a, a few points. I find in general the probation officers are very good, very thorough, and generally very accurate. But there's so much information in a lot of these pre-sentence reports that, that it, inevitably something may, they may get something wrong. So we then will write a letter. Uh, you have a certain time period in which to write a letter objecting to certain parts of the pre-sentence report. The government has the same, uh, they, they may do it as well. And then the probation officer will look at all the objections and make a determination as to whether or not to correct the report. And then we'll do a supplemental report indicating what's been corrected. And if, if the probation officer disagrees, we'll say, well, I'm keeping the report the same, but here's the objection. Perfect. Now, I've I'm speaking very generally here, and I say this because um, well, it's just something I've learned through the years. Is it your experience that sometimes the probation officer, irrespective of how good the PSR might be, may come back with a little higher recommendation than ultimately the government may ask for, or, or is it usually on par? I say this to begin to condition the defendants uh, because it is surreal to read in a report how long 
the government is asking for. And I share that because but between the PSR report and sentencing, a lot of things can happen. Cooperation credit, 5K1s, character reference letters, volunteer work. There are things that could still influence the judge. So talk about, I guess, the reality of reading in a report and how you deal with that with your clients. It, it goes from surreal to real when you read, oh, my God, they're recommending 51 months in jail. So talk about that for a moment. Well, the probation officers usually do a very good job of analyzing the sentencing guidelines mm -hmm. range. And they will go through step by step, point by point, and lay out what they believe the conduct entailed, and then come to a, a sentencing guidelines range. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they're essentially acting like lawyers when they do it. It's the same kind of analysis that we do and we give to our clients. Um, I find in general that the probation officers are pretty much on point. Mm -hmm. um, their, their findings in terms of guidelines ranges are usually about what mine are. And, and usually um, we, as defense lawyers in the government, uh, have an agreement on what the sentencing guideline range is, or we agree to disagree. Sure. And there'll be a couple of points where we disagree. But I find the probation officers are usually pretty much on point. And then, of course, if, if we think that they're wrong on something, we will definitely put it in the objection letter and ask that they cut out these points or those points to reduce the guidelines range. Um, the, the, and the government, I've found, is basically uh, what they'll do is they'll go, usually they'll go to bat for a cooperator. Mm -hmm. But if you're not cooperating or you've been con convicted after trial, that's when they will do everything they can to get the highest guideline range possible, and, and they may not negotiate as much. So that's where cooperation comes in and can really help a defendant. Let's transition to the sentencing memorandum before we get into to sentencing. I received a very frustrating call, and I've received a lot of them over the years from a defendant um, in North Carolina who said, he said, hey, can, can you take a look at my sentencing memorandum? I said, first, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm happy to, to review it, and I've seen enough to offer some insights. And I said, when is the deadline? And he said, well, my lawyer just sent it to me. He said I, he needs my thoughts in 60 minutes. So I said, don't even bother to, you can send it to me, but what type of review can we really go through in 60 minutes? So too many defendants don't review the memorandum. Before we get into what makes up a good memorandum, they don't review it. They're not involved in the process. And if they do get it, sometimes it's too late because it's being turned into the government. So how far in advance should a defendant get their memorandum? How involved should they be? And what makes up a good sentencing memorandum, David? Well, they, they should be involved every step of the way to help, uh, give input to their mm -hmm. defense lawyer about their background, their characteristics, and so on. The, the, the final report, uh, proposed report, they should get at least a week before it's due. Mm -hmm. That will give the defendant um, more than enough time to review it, make corrections, suggest additions, mm -hmm. suggest maybe what should be deleted. Um, that's the, the, the time frame that you need. You need at least a week. Obviously, a day or a few hours yeah. is not enough. Um, and a good sentencing memo, I mean, we can, we can talk about that, but some of it's boilerplate because you're going to analyze the guidelines ranges and things like that. But what's really critical is the person's background, circumstances, and most importantly, I think, are the letters of support mm -hmm. that the defendant gets from family, friends, clergy, people in the community that they've helped. That's where uh, one sentencing memo can be distinguished from another is the quality of the letter, not the quantity, but the quality of mm -hmm. the letters of support that are received on behalf of the defendant. And I let the defendant, uh, my client, organize that, mm -hmm. obviously decide who to reach out to. We, we may provide you know, some bullet points uh, that the defendant can send to the people so that they can consider those in their letters. But in the end, the letters have to be really heartfelt uh, and really emotional, hopefully. Those are the kind of, and explain what a good person mm -hmm. the defendant is, and most of my clients are generally very good people who made a mistake. Those are the kind of letters that influence a judge. Um, and, and I can't emphasize enough how important those letters of support are, Yep. And that's up to the defendant to go to gather these letters, get them done, and get them to the attorney. So a few thoughts I have on the character reference letters. You should speak with your lawyer about the, the quantity. Your lawyer probably will know that judge and might know that judge's pension to read five to ten letters or 50. I've had clients turn in 100 
because the judge will read 100. Others say, I want to focus more on your narrative and let's get five to 10 letters. And times, so if you turn in so many, they say a lot of the same things that can water it down. Certainly, I offer insights, do's and don'ts. Like I suggest you don't implore the judge to take action. He knows the case better than you. So it's articulating one or two specific things you have done to help someone in their life. Colleagues, friends, associates. You should form a list of everyone you know, then craft or create a plan to reach out to them to help you. Quickly on that, don't wait you know, months and months and months and then suddenly call someone out of the blue and say, hey, I need a letter. It's opportunistic. It's a little selfish. Nurture the relationship. Reach out to people. And eventually, you should be prepared to ask them for a letter. And some people will surprise you. Some people will disappoint you. Uh, that's just that's just the way it goes. Okay, David, let, let's talk a little bit about, oh, and one thing that David does exceptionally well in his memos that my lawyer, Joel Athey, also did, besides the boilerplate stuff that judges have seen, they will insert excerpts from the character reference letters. So they're telling a story and they'll insert a paragraph. They're telling a story and they'll insert something from the defendant's narrative. So it's really the telling of a story rather than referencing data all day, all night, the judge has seen a million times. And it's just very convincing when everyone is articulating to the judge. So I want to give you a call out, David. I've seen it. It, it works. OK, let's transition to the sentencing hearing. I filmed a video last week. I got a call actually from another defendant in North Carolina who said, nothing I do matters. The judge doesn't read the memo. He doesn't read the PSR. His mind is made up when he sits down. Of course, I totally disagree. OK, share with us some of your thoughts on the sentencing hearing. Should the defendant make a statement? Should he have family that comes to support him? Give us some of your insights on um, the importance of the sentencing hearing. Well, in my experience, many judges, maybe most judges, have not made up their mind as to what sentence they're going to give until the sentencing hearing itself. Mm -hmm. Because they want to hear from the defendant himself or herself, from the att defendant's attorney, and from the government. So the judges will wait to hear what's going to happen at the sentencing hearing. Now, the speech to the judge by the defendant is the most critical aspect of the sentencing hearing. Because of that, I always, with, with my clients, prepare the speech ahead of time. Yep. This is not the time for an extemporaneous yeah, speech. This isn't the time to freewheel it. No. Yep. I had one client that did that and got the top of the guidelines range. The judge was not pleased with yep. The, with the, the defendant's statement. So we, we prepare it ahead of time. Um, I do it. If there's a prison consultant like you, that's important. Uh, you, you need to get uh, several people's input. So you prepare it, uh, obviously input from the defendant himself or herself as well. Uh, you write it out, you have it ready to go. And then the defendant is ready to give the right kind of speech. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so it's literally absolutely ready to be to be stated at the sentencing hearing and then at the hearing the defendant should certainly have it in front of them mm -hmm. have it available but not read it mm -hmm. needs to you know reference it as necessary but look at the judge look the judge mm -hmm. in the eye that's what the judge wants to to see wants to see what what the defendant's doing feeling and, and so forth so if that speech is 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 very important now that should, there should be remorse contrition maybe if appropriate an explanation of why they did what they did perhaps that they won't be back in front of the judge again um and yes it should their family and friends that's important for them to be there uh, and then of course it's very important what the defendant's attorney has to say as well mm -hmm. and so i will prepare my own speech uh to give on behalf of my clients at sentencing um explaining to the judge from my point of view exactly who the defendant is why they did what they did and 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 why the sentence should be limited uh, if at all and there's alternatives to sentences that you and i have talked about justin mm -hmm. such as community service uh, halfway houses home detention and for aberrate first time aberrational uh, mm -hmm. defendants those are often the, the the kinds of sentences that you hope for and i've gotten a number of my clients have gotten just straight probation mm -hmm. uh, for first offenses. So those are the kind of things, and of course you hope the government's on your side, and they will be if your client has cooperated. If not, expect the government in many cases to go after your client, and I've seen it. And it that works too, in terms of getting a higher sentence 
uh, on the government's part. So it, it's the speech is that's the most important part of the sentencing here. A few parts, few thoughts on the the speech. Uh, Victims are, are the priority. So I understand many of you watching this, I understand the collateral consequences that accompany a white collar crime, like careers and finances, our, our name online. Yeah, I know the fallout that follows this process. First and foremost is to identify with the victims. And I know some defendants have said to me, Justin, it's a, it's a tax crime. Who are the victims? The taxpayers. It is an insider trading case. Who is Who are the victims? The taxpayers. You mean to tell me, you know, Bank of America or Wells Fargo is a victim? Yes, they were defrauded. So regardless of the victim, you have to identify and address them first. Lastly, on this subject, you don't want to try to guilt the judge into not sending you to prison. I've been to a sentencing hearing where the defendant, it was heartfelt, but he said, Your Honor, if you sentence me to prison, I'm not going to be around my kids. I'm going to lose my job and we're losing our home. And almost tried to guilt the judge into not sending him to prison. The judge said, that's not my fault. I cannot not sentence you to prison because of that. It was almost off-putting. So it's almost better to say, as a consequence of my conduct, had I given more thought to my family and my career and my job, I would have made better decisions. I'm going to do better. So the statement is huge. Lastly, if you're going to get sentenced to 24 months or more and the substance abuse program could be in your future, prepare for the right prison. 74% of judicial recommendations were followed in 2015 by the BOP. So ask for RDAP if you have history in your PSR. Ask for the right prison and don't wing that, that statement. It can end uh, terribly. So David, let's close with some final thoughts. Um, whatever you want to discuss, this has been a great video. Anything you'd like to say to defendants who are home wondering what their future will be like, contemplating hiring you as an attorney. As an aside, if you're looking for an attorney across the country, uh, David has been huge in referring me to, to lawyers in his network from Utah to Louisiana to Michigan. So if you're looking for a new lawyer, David and I can help vet. David is in New York. So close with some takeaways for defendants watching this, please. Well, I would say that the most important thing is preparation. Mm -hmm. From the beginning uh, to the end, you got to prepare for the pre-sentence interview. You have to prepare very carefully the sentencing memo. Mm -hmm. You have to prepare for the sentencing hearing. And this is a combination of the defendant and the defendant's lawyer. You have to work very carefully with the probation officer. Put your best foot forward for the probation officer. Remember, right before sentencing, the probation officer goes to the judge's chambers and makes a sentencing recommendation. Mm -hmm. And how you deal and interact with the probation officer may have a very significant effect on the sentence you get. Uh, as we've talked about, the, the, the speeches at the sentencing hearing are absolutely critical. Uh, but the bottom line is you have to be prepared. And every time I've seen things blow up, it was because of a lack of preparedness, a defendant who says, don't worry, I can handle it, I can do this speech mm -hmm. extemporaneously. That's when things go bad. When you're prepared, things will go much better and you're much more likely to get a better sentence. I closed, to close, I closed a video last week. I titled it, Do My Sentencing Preparations Really Matter? Uh, in response to this defendant who said nothing that he did matter. Your goal, and I've been there as a white collar defendant, I know what it, what it was like to stand in front of Judge Wilson to be sentenced to prison with victims there and my mom in the front row sobbing. But I was able to hold my head I would dignity that day because I said, and what I want all of you to say, is regardless of the outcome, there's nothing more I could have done to prepare for this moment. That's what we wish for all of you. That's the reason we're doing this video, and that's the reason that David's a lawyer and I've chosen to, to be a prison consultant so we can help guide you. David, thank you for your expertise and insights. By the way, David wrote a blog on the same subject. I'll post it on the White Collar Advice site, and I'll put a link to that blog in this YouTube channel. So thank you again for sharing your expertise, David. Thanks, Justin. I appreciate you having me. My pleasure.